The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Lord, there are a hundred billion galaxies in the universe. In ours alone, there are a hundred thousand million stars, many larger than our own sun. And our sun is huge. It's a hundred times larger than the earth. It's 400 times larger than our moon. Yet marvelously, the moon appears to be the same size to our eyes because it's 400 times closer. Such precision is only a whispered tribute to the majesty of the one who spoke it all into being. You are awesome in the truest sense of the word. In your presence, how can we not be amazed? What are we that you should be mindful of us? Yet, small as we are, you care for us. You love us more than we know. This morning, we praise you. You are an awesome God. You are holy, great, and mighty. The moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but still you love me. Forever, my heart will sing of how great you are. Good morning, church. How glorious is our God. Let's stand and give him praise. Blessed are those who run to him, who place their hope and confidence in Jesus. He won't forsake them. Blessed are those who seek his face, who bend their knee and fix their gaze on Jesus. They won't be shaken. Come on and praise the Lord with me. Sing if you love his name. Come on and lift your Praise that cost me. Bless God when nobody 
who's watching every chance I get. I bless your name. Bless God when the weapons for me. Bless God when the walls are falling. Bless God because he goes before me every chance I get. Song do we sing for man? 
We're starting our time in this place this morning with a uh, our simple refrain of reverence. Lord, it sets our hearts in place. It, uh, it puts us uh, in the right place before you. Lord, even to sing the word glory and to have maybe a, a 2% understanding, Lord, of what that means. With respect to you, the king of all, the maker of the cosmos, the one who formed us, and the great and loving father who sent his son for us. When we were wandering in darkness to offer light, not just for this moment that we live in, but so that we could know you and we could walk with one another. Lord, in the way that you intended. Lord, that is glorious. You are glorious beyond anything, beyond anyone. Lord, we want our hearts to stay in this place this morning. Would you help us to do that by your spirit, through your word, in your name. Good morning, church. We are really glad to see you. It's a joy to worship with you. Um, would you turn and share that joy with your neighbor and say hello? Isaiah 40:11 says that God tends his flock like a shepherd and he gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Jesus cares deeply about children and takes care of those he's placed in charge of them. Christ Community wants to bless families in our church and our community with a baby item swap on Wednesday, April 10th from 9 to 11 a.m. You can participate by donating your gently used baby items and clothing, as well as maternity and nursing items today at the kiosk, April 9th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. or even the day of. Please also spread the word to parents and caregivers of this wonderful event. Our meal packaging event is only one week away. Are you signed up yet? If not, consider this your official invitation to join us next Sunday morning, April 14th. Instead of regular church services, we'll gather in the gym to package meals for Haiti. This is an opportunity to serve together as a body, but really, it's about so much more than that. 
It's about showing Christ's love to the people of Haiti, where a staggering 44% of the population is facing acute hunger, and hundreds die daily from malnutrition. The need is great, and we have the opportunity to help, to help our partners feed their community. We've purchased more supplies than ever before. All we need is you. Practically speaking, what can you do? Well, we still have a lot of open spots and ways for you to pitch in. If you're an early riser, come package at 8.30. Consider staying for a second packaging session. If you sign up for the last session, stay later to ensure all packages are filled. Volunteer to refill ingredients and load boxes, or help us set up on Saturday afternoon. And invite a friend to join us. It's gonna take all of us working together to reach this goal. Register online or fill out the paper sign up and drop it off at the kiosk. We'll see you here next week as we serve together. Well, good morning, church. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, why don't you grab a Bible that's near you, next to you, on that phone in your pocket, and make your way to Mark chapter 9, and I will be right back. I'm going to go get a table, all right? Be right back. You get your Bible, I'm going to get a table, and then we'll preach, all right? Right, y'all find your Bibles? I found my table. We're in business. Here we are. Well, we are walking through the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 9 as we are turning pages through Mark's Gospel. Uh, This morning also, as you heard on our vision announcements, we have a unique opportunity ahead of us next Sunday. So uh, on your chairs this morning, uh, there's this little white piece of paper, little sign-up form, okay? Uh, There's also a QR code on the screen. So if you've got your phone out, you can scan that QR code and it'll take you to the registration page for the 100,000 Meals event next Sunday. A couple really quick details uh, that we need to note for next Sunday. We will not have gathered worship together. Instead, we are locking arm in arm, giving of our time and our talents in order to serve our neighbors near and far and to, and to help come alongside of our global partners in Haiti. And so we will have three packaging hours, 8.30, 9.30 and 10.30, right? So if you show up for worship at 9 o'clock, right, uh, you have, we'll, we'll be in the middle of beginning our first packing hour. You'll be early for the, for, the, uh, for the 9.30 shift though, okay? All right, so that's good news. If you normally attend at 10.45 and you show up at 10.45, we'll fit you in, but you'll be on the back end of the third packing hour, okay? So make sure you note right now, we've got three hours next week. We're not doing gathered worship. Instead, we are, we are going to be the church in that we are serving with our time and our talents as we are packing meals for our partners at UCI in Haiti. So 8.30, 9.30, 10.30. And you'll notice on the sheet here, we especially need help at the 8.30 and the 10.30 packing hour. So you'll see those two hours that are listed there. And you can also sign up. It's two-sided. Okay, how neat is that? All right, two-sided. We also need some help Saturday afternoon getting the gym set up. And then Sunday, the heavy lifting crew. All right, so, you know, if you are strong, strong of heart, or you're just a strong encourager, all right, we will need you on the heavy lifting crew as we are re, re, uh, replenishing the tables as we go through the morning with rice, with beans, with all of the, the, the nutritional supplements that go into the packaged meal. So lots of ways to, to sign up. Bring your friends, invite friends, invite family. Uh, this is a great opportunity. Uh, we've got spots, we've got total spots of over 1,000 uh, for people to be able to package. So 1,000 people uh, can be here and easily package here next Sunday. It's a great opportunity. And uh, as you heard, Christy, on the announcements, uh, these meals are going. We're gonna, we're, our goal is to package 158,000 meals on Sunday. And if we do that, we will hit the million meal mark of the, over the 15 years that we've been doing this event. And right now, if you've been following the news, 
uh, you know that things are critical in Haiti. The situation is in turmoil. It's, it's, it's changing daily uh, and not often for the better. And so we have a unique opportunity as a local body to come alongside of our global partners, Jean-Jean and Christy Montpierre, who will be here with us next week for this event. That'll be great. They'll be with us. And, uh, and so we'll have an opportunity to bless them and encourage them richly as they care for their community in the most tangible ways possible uh, by, by providing food uh, for them in this significant time. And I just want to say thank you to you guys as a church, to us as a church, because we were able to ambitiously step into this opportunity that's ahead of us because you have given generously towards the mission of Christ's community as we yearn to help connect people into life-defining relationships in Jesus uh, because Jesus is the one that changes us from the inside out. And because you've been faithful, you've been generous, radically generous with your treasure, with your finances, giving towards the mission faithfully and consistently, we were able to step into this moment and this opportunity with confidence and ambitiously able to then bless partners. So thank you so much for your willingness to cooperate with the Spirit of God as he leads us to honor God with our time, our talents, and our treasure. So next Sunday uh, on the 14th, 8.30, 9.30, 10.30, meal packing times. You can fill out this. You can drop it in a box in the back. You can put it at the Welcome Center uh, with uh, Pastor Brent, whoever's there. He handed it at the Welcome Center. And or there's the kiosk in HRM1. You can drop it off there or you can sign up online. So let's not miss this opportunity here next Sunday to lock arm in arm and, and be the hands and feet of the Lord as we honor God with our time, talents, and treasure, and we yearn to be a blessing to those not just in our community here, but to the very ends of the earth. All right? Well, church, we're, again, we're in Mark chapter 9. Let me pray for us, and then we'll jump into the text. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for your grace that covers us. Uh, Lord, um, often you know the prayer that we pray as a family at, at, at dinner time of, of grace. Lord, that you would help our hearts increase in gratitude. Because, Lord, you are the one who has provided for us. So, Father, as we, as we look to the text here this morning, and, Lord, as we look to next week with the 100,000 meals uh, opportunity, Lord, we, we ask that you, would, that you would grow our hearts in gratitude. Uh, that we would see the ways that you are providing for us day by day that your grace and your love covers us, that we would see the the lavishness of love that you have poured over us in and through your son, Jesus. And so would we see you, Jesus, more clearly this morning. It is in your great name we pray. Amen. Well, Mark chapter 9, we're about to step into the, the transfiguration of Jesus. And as we, as we step into this passage, we will see a theme that we have seen emerge recently as we're journeying with Mark through his gospel. And that is the, the confusion of the disciples. Right? The disciples keep answering the question of who is Jesus correctly, but they get the wrong implication, right? Like they, they passed the Scantron exam, but they didn't understand what it meant or how it impacted their, their lives. The crowds continue to misunderstand Jesus. The religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, they have completely missed Jesus. But we saw that back in chapter 3. That's not a new story at this point. The confusion of the disciples specifically, though, is a theme that Mark is drawing on. And here in in the transfiguration of Jesus, one scholar, he put it this way. He said that if the confession of Peter shows us how we and how the disciples are to think about Jesus... The transfiguration offers us a clear picture of the nature of Jesus, of who he is precisely. See, the Apostle Paul will come to the same conclusion that we will come to here out of Mark chapter 9 this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul will say this. He will say that if Jesus did not uh, resurrect, if Jesus did not come back from the grave, then our faith is in vain and we are to be pitied as fools. Because if Jesus is not God, if he's not God, then what we are doing here is nothing more than a social club. It's nothing more than a book club. We are, as Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 15, to be pitied as fools. And the disciples, the disciples who keep hanging in here with Jesus, and we have the benefit of looking down the road. We can fast forward a few pages and we see how the story ends. They're living in it. They're living in it. 
and they keep coming back to Jesus. But if he's not who he is, if he's not God, if his nature is not clear from the transfiguration, oh, then they are the biggest fools of all. And so with that lens in mind, that thought in mind, let's begin to read Mark chapter 9, verse 2. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the inner three of the larger twelve. And, and he led them up a high mountain before, uh, bef- by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to be with him Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And, and Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, teacher, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And I love the note that Mark puts in verse 6. Because Peter did not know what to say because he was terrified. <laughs> like nervous excitement, nervous energy. And Peter's like, hey, you got some friends. Great. You want me to put up some tents? We can hang out. Maybe we'll get some snacks. We'll like have a good chat, okay? Like Peter does not know what to say in this moment. He just knows he is in a very important moment. You ever been there? You ever had that sort of nervous excitement in front of somebody that you were impressed to meet? I've been there, right? Peter's here. For Peter did not know what to say because he was terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And they were, and as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them. Jesus told them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, but they were confused, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why did the scribes say that the first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you, Elijah has come. And they did to him whatever they pleased as it was written of him. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes with them, and they were arguing. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted Jesus. And he asked them, what are you arguing about? And someone from the crowd said to him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And Jesus answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to Jesus. And when the spirit saw him, immediately convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground, and he rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long, has he been, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And, and, it is as, and it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And oh, we've met Jesus before, haven't we? We've met his compassion. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out. And he said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mutant deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So Here we are. Jesus is transfigured, and Jesus is again doing the things that only Jesus can do. Uh, Again, uh, over and over again, Mark's goal, Mark's aim, Mark's purpose is for you, for me, for everyone who reads his gospel is to see Jesus clearly. We're coming off the heels of Peter's confession. You are the Christ. Peter gets it right on the Scantron test, but he misunderstands the implications of it. And so here now, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, the inner three, up onto a high mountain, and he is transfigured. His his clothes are made radiant white, and there is a voice in a cloud that speaks. 
a voice in a cloud, and he says, this is my son, listen to him, right? See, this whole, the transfiguration is an echo, it's a, it's a reflection, a reminder of the Exodus story. It, it, and the, to understand the Exodus story is crucial in understanding what is going on here. Because if we remember the Exodus story, God covers his people, God, God is with his people as a, as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And the heart of God in the Exodus story is, is God's desire to redeem his people out of their bondage and oppression. And, and God has sent his son, Jesus, as a ransom for many to do what? To redeem us out of our bondage and oppression to sin. And so here at the Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John get a front row seat, not just to understand how to think about Jesus, but how to see Jesus and understand his nature as divine, as fully God, clearly. And so the Father speaks again over Jesus. And if you've been following with us, you might, you might be reminded of the last time we ran into the Father speaking over the Son at Jesus' baptism in the Gospel of Mark. And what does the father say at the baptism of Jesus? Uh, the father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, right? Uh, God, God identifies, this is my son, I am well pleased in him. This is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. He has always been God's son. If you go back to Luke chapter 2. Remember Luke chapter 2, uh, where, where uh, they're in Jerusalem. Jesus is just a, a boy still. They're in Jerusalem. And, uh, and Mary and Joseph get Parent of the Year Award, okay, right? Because they left Jesus in Jerusalem for how many days? Anybody know? A little quick Bible quiz. Three days, right? It's been a minute, you know, and they're like on the road back to home. Anybody ever leave your kid somewhere? No hands, okay? Don't do that. We won't, we won't confess publicly because I've never done that. <laughs> Oh, you hit four kids and you're just like, where are they? Who knows, okay, right? It is chaos, all right? Mary and Joseph, it's been three days. They forget Jesus. They leave him in Jerusalem. And when they get back and Jesus is like, I'm in my father's house. You should know where I would have been. And Jesus has always been God's son. Remember the miraculous birth, the, uh, the, the virgin conception, the angel that came and told Mary, blessed are you. And Mary said, yeah. she, she said yes to God's invitation to be invited into this redemptive plan of history. Oh, he has always been God's son the whole way through. There's always been something distinctively different about Jesus in comparison to everyone else in human history. But here again, God is affirming. At the baptism, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And now at the transfiguration, again, we're three years into Jesus' earthly life and ministry. We are nearing the cross more and more. Every day the cross is getting closer. And Jesus is actively preparing his disciples, actively preparing the 12 for life after the cross. That they would carry the good news message forward in the face of persecution and tribulation and suffering and sorrow and hardship. And we've got the inner three here with him in chapter 9, Peter, James, and John. They've been with him since the beginning. And when we look at the New Testament as a whole, it's going to be Peter and John in the book of Acts. Peter and John are going to be the first ones declaring the resurrection. Peter is going to become a, a prolific speaker, which is an irony of ironies here. Because at this moment, Peter's all nervous and he's like, hey, I see your friend showed up. Do we need some snacks? Need a place to hang out? What are we going to do, right? Like, again, foot in mouth, Peter, and at Pentecost, Peter declares the beauty, the glory, the wonder of the resurrection, and many believe. Now, Peter and John and Paul will become the three primary authors of the New Testament. Oh, Jesus is doing something strategic here with them, for them, that they would see his nature. And what does the Father say to them about his son? Listen to him. Listen to him. He is God. He is the Messiah. Oh, Peter, you were right, but you need to listen to him. And they're still confused about the resurrection. They're still confused about what's to come. And again, we can have sympathy. They're living in the moment. We get to read ahead. We get to understand what happens and then read back with that knowledge in mind. We can read the end of the story first and then come back through all the hard and confusing stuff, right? They don't get that. They're living in it. 
And God is graciously showing them over and over again just who Jesus is. In fact, again, Mark doesn't want us to miss Jesus. It would be a tragedy to miss Jesus. And one scholar, he puts it this way. He uh, unpacks the transfiguration. Excuse me, he unpacks the transfiguration this way. He says, the transfiguration shows that he, Jesus, is God. Unequivocally, precisely, perfectly, completely God. He produces the glory. It emanates from him. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. Oh, it's also what the author of Hebrews will tell us in chapter 1, verse 3, that he is the glory and the radiance of God. John will tell us, again, John, the guy who's one of the guys who's here at the transfiguration in the opening of his gospel, he will tell us in chapter 1, verse 18, that we see the Father precisely through Jesus, right? This moment had an impact on them. And I wonder when John was writing his gospel, years after John's the latest, he's the, the final gospel to be written of the four gospels. I wonder when John was an old man and he was writing down his gospel in the, in the opening prologue, the opening section where he, where he unpacks and uncovers in a uniquely Greek way, a uniquely philosophical way, that Jesus is God incarnate and he came for you and me out of the lavishness of his love. I wonder if in the back of his mind he has this moment as he's writing it. I wonder if he remembers Jesus, the glory of God emanating from him because he is God. His clothes becoming so white that no one could bleach them that they were that white. Oh, I wonder, I wonder when Peter is preaching at Pentecost. I wonder when Peter is preaching over and over again through the New Testament. If this moment is there and he goes, oh yeah, the resurrection, but oh, the transfiguration. That was the first moment something clued into me, that Jesus is different. He's different. And Mark wants us to see exactly who Jesus is, that we wouldn't miss him. Because if he is God, if he is the one whom is described here, then as we've said time and time again, nothing has to be the same. That Jesus is, in fact, in the business of changing lives. But then the question uh, continues for us. There's these figures, Elijah and Moses, that are mentioned. And, and this is all nice, and it's kind of ethereal. Jesus with the white clothes and all of that. But, but isn't he just one of many religious leaders? Isn't he just one of many people that have done miraculous things across human history? Like, what truly separates him? What truly makes him unique? How are we to understand that? Is Jesus... More than just a prophet. You see, in the transfiguration, Moses and Elijah show up. And, and that should be something that, that clues us in. Oh, there's something significant going on here. Because Moses and Elijah, they are the heroes of the Old Testament. They're the heroes of the Old Testament. They, there are no two figures that are more important than, than those two, okay? Why? Because through Moses, uh, he, we receive the law because Moses gave the law, right? The first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all right? Uh, that right there, that's uh, Old Testament 101, all right? Uh, the first five books are given through Moses. And in them, we see the character and the nature of God. The first 11 verses or first 11 chapters, excuse me, of Genesis they're theological in nature. They're not a scientific text. They're not trying to merely express or explain how God created the earth. There's, there's great questions that we can engage in that sphere. But the text itself is not telling us how God created it. It's telling us about the one who has created. It's theological in nature. The book of Leviticus, in fact, if you've ever tried to read Leviticus, I commend you if you've made it past chapter 3, okay? Okay. Like, it, it, gets, it gets pretty pretty boring in there, right? There's a lot of laws, then there's the whole sacrificial system, and we're, like, confused by it. And I honestly, here's a confession. I never read through the book of Leviticus until I was forced to in seminary, right? Like, because seminary can do that. They're like, those books of the Bible that you would never read, saddle up. you got to outline it, okay? <laughs> right? And it's going to be good for you. And you're like, mm, I'm not sure it will be. And then you get into it, and it is. It is. See, the entire book of Leviticus is a book of the law. It's expressing all the ins and outs of the law, all the particulars of the law. Deuteronomy is a retelling of the law. 
But Leviticus itself, it hinges around chapter 16, which is the Day of Atonement. Do you know what the Day of Atonement is? The Day of Atonement is the day that God provides for his people by forgiving the sins that they did not know that they committed. The entire law, the entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament hinges around the fact that God is a God of grace and the only hope that we can have is because he is willing to do for us what we desperately need and could never do for ourselves. The entire Old Testament law hinges on that fact. And what do we receive in Jesus? What do we receive at the meal of communion? That God loves you and me so much that he was willing to do for us what we desperately needed but could not do on our own. And so he gave his one and only son. And for anyone who believes in Jesus by faith through grace, because Jesus is a gift that we could not earn, we do not deserve. Anyone who believes in Christ as Lord and Savior by faith through grace is welcomed into the household of God. This meal is a remembrance of God's lavish love and grace and that his character has remained the same the whole way through. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy all point to the reality of God's grace. And that came through Moses. And so Moses is revered in the Old Testament and Elijah is revered as one of the the strongest prophets if you, remember, if you remember Elijah, Elijah defeats the, uh, defeated Baal's prophets at, at Mount Carmel, right? Remember that story where, uh, where, where Elijah's there and he's, and he's goading on the prophets and he's like, hey, yo, keep, keep putting on, keep stacking the wood, keep doing it, you know, keep shouting, keep getting louder. Maybe your gods can't hear you, right? Maybe they're sleeping. And then, and then when it's Elijah's turn, he's like, hey, uh, bring the fire engine out and just douse it in water, okay? And then when they doused it, he goes, not enough, do it again. Do it again, right? To the point where it's so wet that nothing can burn. And he prays, and what does God do? God not only consumes the wood that was on the altar, he consumes through fire the altar itself. Oh, Moses and Elijah are seen as the two most significant figures in the Old Testament. And if you remember uh, back a few chapters when, when Herod was west wrestling, uh, when King Herod was wrestling with who is Jesus, he thought he was John the Baptist resurrected. Why? Because he had done incredible injustice by murdering John the Baptist. And he thought, oh no, this is it. John's back, and he's back for vengeance on me. Right? Uh, when, when Peter, James, and John, when they see Moses and Elijah in their theological system, this is it. This is it. This is the moment. The, 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 the two most prominent figures of the Old Testament are here. This is it. This is the moment. God is going to reign supreme. The kingdom is going to come. We are going to be put on the top of the geopolitical sphere again. And yet Jesus wants them to understand his true nature. Again, poor Peter. Poor Peter. Can I set some tents up? (laughs) Nervous energy. He doesn't fully understand. Yet Jesus is patiently, graciously showing him over and over and over again. Exactly who he is. Patiently and graciously showing him over and over and over again. What his plan for redemption is what his kingdom will be about. And oh, one day Peter will get it. Peter will write in in his letter, 1 Peter, he will say, we are exiles. Oh, at one point in time, I thought this kingdom, this place, this, this moment was the kingdom that we were in, that we were to be a part of. Oh, I was wrong. I was wrong. No, we are part of a kingdom that lasts for all of eternity because we are brought into the family of God, into the household of God by grace. It is Jesus, 1 Peter 1, verse 4, it is Jesus that keeps our salvation secure for us in heaven. It's not anything that we've done. It is all through Christ alone. Oh, Peter, who's at this moment thinking about the earthly kingdom, he will understand eventually that Jesus is inviting us into a kingdom not of this age, not of this world, but a kingdom that lasts forever. But in this moment, he asks if he can set up some tents, and we have some sympathy, and we, and we understand. And here's Jesus doing again what only Jesus can do. It's not just the transfiguration, but they come down off the mountain And these three disciples are wrestling and they're churning and they're wondering, who is 
Jesus. And what does he mean by this resurrection? What does he mean by this rising from the dead? Again, messiahs don't die. Messiahs don't go to the grave. That's not how the Messiah is supposed to act and operate. And they're confused and they're wondering and they come down. And the rest of the disciples are arguing with the scribes. Verse 14, not an uncommon scene at this point. Uh, But they're they're arguing. And Jesus heals a boy that's possessed with an unclean spirit. Again, doing things that only Jesus can do. And it's clear here that there is one who is filled with glory, one who is filled with might, one who is filled with redemptive power. And do you you hear the Father in verse 24? I want you to pull out your pens. I want you to underline the, the, the phrase, I believe, help my unbelief. Because in the contrast of the disciples wrestling with the nature of who Jesus is in the transfiguration, we see this father who cries out. A circle the phrase cried out. It is this, it is this guttural cry. It is this, it is this moment from the, the most inner parts of him saying, I can't do this on my own. I need you to help me. And so he cries out, I believe. Help my unbelief. And here in this moment, that is the dependency that God wants for us to have on him. That is the dependency that the disciples will get to. They will be there eventually. In this moment, they're still confused. In this moment, they're still wrestling. And we get this picture of beautiful dependency. And we get this picture of these figures of the Old Testament that clarify exactly who Jesus is. And Mark doesn't want us to mix them up. Mark doesn't want us to mix them up. See, Moses and Elijah reflected. They reflected the glory of God. Right? They did not, the glory of God did not emanate from them. But in Jesus, he is the glory of God. Why? Because he is God. Moses and Elijah spoke from God. Jesus speaks as God. And Mark doesn't want us to miss this. He doesn't want us to mix this up. We see the transfiguration. We see the healing of this young boy. And it is stuff that only Jesus can do. And we've seen it time and time again. But there is none like Jesus. And so for you and for me in this moment, as we look at at this passage and we look at this moment, we have to ask ourselves, do we really believe that Jesus is God? Do we really believe that Jesus is God? Uh, a few weeks ago, I, I told you uh, that I would only meddle once a quarter, right? <laughs> okay? And I asked the question, what are the gods of Ames? We're not going to meddle again this morning, I promise. Only once a quarter, the quarter's not up again, okay? All right? You guys got a few more months before I start meddling again, all right? But this passage begs us to ask those questions again because Mark is holding that diamond up for us, that diamond of who is Jesus, and he keeps rotating it. He keeps turning it for us and looking at the glory and the magnificence and the beauty and the grace and the love that is extended to us and over us through Jesus himself. And the question keeps coming back, who do we trust What are the gods of our lives? What are the things that we look to to deliver our greatest good? And if Jesus is God, if he is exactly who is described here in the text, then we need to live like it. We need to follow as if he is, submit to him as if he is, cry out in dependency like this father in verse 24, help me. If he is the God that's portrayed here, then he wants to help us. And so how do we participate and live in the glory of God? How do we walk in faith and obedience with Christ? And the first step is dependency. Dependency. God doesn't expect us to figure it out all on our own or to have it all wrapped up in a neat little box. If he did, oh, I wouldn't be able to be your pastor, okay? We're all works in progress. We're all here because we need the grace of God to cover us. We need the love of God to be made real in our lives We need Jesus to do a work in us. The first step of following God faithfully and obediently is the picture of this father, the dependence. Do we cry out first thing in the morning, Lord, help me today. This is the day that you have given me. You have have caused air to be in my lungs this morning, my heart to beat and to pump. Help me to follow you and to honor you today. 
And I think, I think a second way that we, that we participate in the glory of God in this age and in this moment, particularly for us in Midwest America, is that we resist the lies of this age. We resist the powers of this age that promise things that they could never deliver. And, and again, we're in one of those moments, aren't we? We're in one of those cycles in the history and the nature of our country where, where everyone, the political figures around us, are going to make promises that we all know that they're not going to deliver on, and yet we allow our hearts to get sucked in, or we allow our fears to get stoked, and, and we walk as if the, the powers of this age can deliver something that Jesus can't. And the transfiguration and the healing of this boy point to us again. If Jesus isn't God, then what we're doing, we're foolish. But if he is, if he is, then what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Remember, Peter? This age is all that there is. Oh, no. There's something far more. If, if Jesus is God, then we need the words of Peter. Or he tells us. He tells us that we are to live as exiles. Why? Because this place is not our home. So let's not get sucked in to the power plays and the empty promises of this age. Oh, yes, we live in this moment and we need to be a faithful witness. Don't hear me wrong. But what do we look to for our greatest good? And how do we resist the lies of this age? Because Jesus is God alone and he offers us abundant life through grace. It's what this table is all about. It's what Mark wants us to see over and over again. And he holds that diamond of Jesus up over and over again. Who is Jesus? And who is he to you? Let's keep wrestling with that. Let's keep chewing on that. And may we walk in dependence this week a little bit more than we did last week. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word that continues to show us Jesus, continues to remind us of your grace and love for us. From day one, from moment one, you are the God of grace, you are the God of life. So this morning as we continue in worship and we continue in prayer, would you meet us where we're at? Would you show us who you are precisely? And give us clarity on the hope that we have in you, Lord Jesus. It is in your great name we pray. Amen. Men, church, would you rise and sing with us?
the great is your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all Jesus. your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name it stands say holy 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 we throw our crowns at your feet father and we crown you holy lord we ask that you would just be with us in this invitation god we thank you for this invitation god amen you may be seated morning. My name is Elaine Cox. My husband and I, Al is my husband, we work at Iowa State University with the Navigators with international students. We lived overseas in Indonesia for 14 years, so we know what it's like to not know the language or the culture or have any family or friends there. We're very empathetic to the internationals who are here. I have the joy of leading you in Holy Communion today. And uh, it is an open communion, which means if you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, then you are welcome to eat with us. If you have not done that yet, then please just let it pass. No one will be offended. But if you're a member or not, it doesn't matter. If you have surrendered your life to Christ, you're welcome to join us. Can we have the servers come forward and begin serving, please? When it's passed to you, please just hold it and we will eat together. <clears throat> This past week, we celebrated Easter, which is our most joyous day for us, when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, as he said he would raise from the dead. Usually, Passover is at the same time, and in fact, Jesus celebrated Passover with his disciples before he died. So I wanted to just give you a little taste of what Passover is. This year, because of the Jewish calendar, 
Passover will be April 22 and 23, depending on where you live. So this, this is um, just my idea of it. It, it. it is like a Seder plate. My husband and I ce have celebrated Seder uh, with um, Orthodox Jews and then more recently with Messianic Jews. So Messianic Jews are ones who know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and they have surrendered their lives to him. So they truly understand Passover. So these are the things on the Seder plate. <clears throat> the first is a shank bone of a sheep. And I'll read a verse to you in a minute about that. The next thing is an egg. This is a symbol of the circle of life and of spring, and that's also consumed during the Seder. The next are bitter herbs, onions, and parsley, and they are dipped in the next one, which is salt water, which symbolizes the children of Israel in Egypt being persecuted and abused, and these are their tears. So the bitter herbs are dipped in the, in the salt water to simplify that. The next are raisins and um, walnuts and apples and spices. And this symbolizes the mortar that they used between the straw bricks to build the houses of the Egyptians. And this one is the unleavened bread. Remember, they couldn't leaven their bread. They had to run, and I'll read you that verse in just a minute. But the matzah has holes throughout it because, as we know, Jesus Christ died, was wrapped in cloth like this, but his body was pierced. So the symbolism here is that, that his body was pierced for us. And the last is the wine, which is juice. They do it four times. We're not doing it four times today. This is from Exodus 12. Each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or from the goats. Members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked in your belt your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and will strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you in the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Jesus is our Passover lamb. Wrapped, he came to die, and he was wrapped in cloth, and his body was broken for us. Uh, John even recognizes him when he walks up to him, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then in Revelation, Worthy are you, to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people from, for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Take and eat. This is the symbol of the body of Christ broken for you. Eat and remember what he has done for us. And as Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples, he said to them, this is the blood of the covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink all of it and remember what he has done for us all. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we know that your word is truth. You've said that a virgin will conceive and bear a son. He will suffer, he will die, and he will raise from the dead. 
And so we know, Lord, that everything that you've said has happened. So we know that the next thing that you've said is about the return of Jesus Christ to take his own. Your word says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the cry of the archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. And so we will always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. Father, we are so grateful for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Truly, the Lamb of God. You've said, too, that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Thank you that we are passed over because you have shed your blood and died for us. We worship you. We give glory to you. And, Father, we look forward to your return. We pray in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand, church? Let's respond. Jesus, it's because of your sacrifice that we will forever lift your name. You deserve all the praise. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name spend our week just singing and praising holy 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 amen church we've been praying for you all week that this morning would be one that encourages you and um, reminds you that strength comes from christ and not you um, so whatever your week looks like this week um, may the lord bless you as you go if you need prayer Write a prayer on the card, and the staff loves to pray for you. So, may the Lord bless you as you go. It's good to see you.